In chapter six, we will be discussing all about sketching. So putting together the information that we have about the derivatives and producing a fairly accurate and detailed graph of a function. Let's start by talking about just the overall all shape of the function. We've already talked, we've used this vocabulary of functions increasing and decreasing, and that's a fairly intuitive notion. If a function is increasing, it can increase, for example, in this way, we understand this as a trend as the function goes upwards, but the function can also increase in this way. The one way to describe an increase really is just to think about tangent lines. And in both of those cases, the tangent lines have positive slope. Positive slope of a tangent line means the derivative is positive. So if someone tells you that the derivative of a function at a certain interval is positive, you know it's increasing. But that's not enough information to distinguish between the two cases of the very different type of increase that the function can take. So let's think about the next step. How can I, what can I say about these two functions to really differentiate between these two cases? Let's look not just at one tangent line, but at maybe two or three tangent lines to the same graph. So in this case, let's say, let's draw another tangent line later on. And now let's look at these cases as drawn now. So we can see that here tangent lines start off shallow and get steeper and steeper. Whereas here it's the opposite. They start off being steep and then they, as the function plateaus, the derivative or sorry, the tangent lines also get shallower and shallower. And that is going to be our essential difference between those two cases. How does the derivative grow itself? Does the derivative become higher, a bigger number, or does the derivative get smaller? So thinking about the rate of growth of slope, really have to pause for a second and decide what is it that we're really discussing here. The slope itself, the slope of a tangent line is the first derivative. The rate of growth of something is a derivative of that. So in order for us to distinguish between those two cases, we have to discuss the second derivative of the function. So this will break up into two cases, depending on what the second derivative behaves like. So in this first case here, the derivative itself grows higher and higher, which means its rate of change is positive. So the rate of change is positive and it's the rate of change of a derivative. A derivative of a derivative is just a second derivative. So instead of having this notation, we can simply say f prime prime of x, okay? And in the second case, the rate of change of the slope is negative because it gets smaller and smaller. So that means that our second derivative in this case is negative. In fact. I'm not gonna include the zero here. That's the case we're going to describe, discuss separately, okay? So when the second derivative of the function is positive, this corresponds to this shape, and we call that upwards looking shape concave up. The second case when the derivative is negative corresponds to this case where the function is sort of looking down. So we're calling this concave down. In case of a function decrease, the situation is going to be very analogous, except for reversed. So in order to try to follow this logic, maybe pause the video for a second and see if you can create the exact same column, but for a negative first derivative and the two cases for the second derivative. Now, of course, you can see here now that it's very, very similar. So for this first function, the derivative is always negative but as time goes on, it becomes less and less negative, meaning that it's actually increasing. So the second derivative is positive, whereas the second case, the second derivative gets steeper and steeper, which means it's becoming more and more negative, and therefore the second derivative itself is negative. So those are the two main shapes that will uh, be describable by a second derivative. Concave up, meaning that your function sort of looks like an upward cup, and concave down means that it's facing downwards. 
In terms of special points on the function, we will talk about local extrema and global extrema. Extrema means maximum or minimum, and these are um, rigorous definitions of what it means to be minimum and what it means to be maximum. Essentially, what this is saying is that a local maximum is the point that is the highest point around. So if you look at points near it, point X is on sort of some sort of a peak. Whereas local minimum means that for all the points near it, that's the lowest point around. Global behavior means it's the highest point in the entire domain or on some specified region. Now, thinking about what we described on the previous slide as the general um, behavior of the function and thinking about these special points, how does the function get to a local maximum or a local minimum? So if we're thinking about one of these peak points around, what happens to the function before and after? So let's think, for example, about local maximum. In order for the function to have a local maximum, it means that the function has to increase up to that point and then decrease afterwards, okay? Now, thinking back to the previous slide, there's a couple of ways that that can happen. So we will actually have a number of different possible cases for increase followed by a decrease. Let's try to describe just a few of them. Now the function could have increased in, for example, this way to the point of local maximum and then decreased in this way afterwards, which formed the local maximum in the middle. The function could have also increased, for example, in this way to the point of local maximum and then decreased like this. Take a minute here, try to come up with other possible cases for the function to increase and decrease that will look qualitatively different from these two graphs. Now, the one thing that though that they will have in common is increase is described by first derivative being positive. So on the left-hand side here, this means that the derivative of the function is positive as the slopes of the tangent lines are positive. And the decrease is described by the derivative of the function being negative function's derivative going from positive to negative through this point in the middle is what creates a local max. Okay, so these are again not the only two cases uh, where a function can acquire a local maximum. Um, try to also come up with cases for a local minimum. That is of course when the decrease will be followed by an increase, but you have choices for what the function looks like concavity-wise on the decrease and on the increase. Now, thinking about these two cases, though, then what happened at the top is that the tangent line here is actually horizontal, which means that in this case, the derivative at the local max was zero. Whereas in the second situation, the derivative is a slope of the tangent line at this point, but this is a corner. This is exactly one of the cases when the function is not differentiable. I cannot draw a unique tangent line. I wouldn't know which way it goes. So this case corresponds to the function's derivative at the peak does not exist. And this motivates us to come up with a useful definition of a critical point that will describe both of these cases. So a point is called a critical point if first of all, it's an actual point on the graph, so the function value has to exist at that point. And second is description of these two cases. Either the derivative is zero, which means that the tangent line is horizontal, or the derivative does not exist, which means that I cannot construct a tangent line there, but I might have hit a local peak um, or a local value. Now, first derivative test tells us how to turn the information that we gathered on the previous slide into actually classifying a point as local maximum or local minimum. So the first derivative test says that a critical point, which is where the derivative is either zero or does not exist, is an extremum, meaning it's maximum or minimum, if the derivative actually changes sign at P. So notice that it's not that the point is critical that determines whether it's a maximum or minimum. It's the fact that at that point, derivative goes from positive for example, to negative or the other way around. So let's take a look at those two cases. The first one, the derivative goes from negative, which means the function is decreasing 
to positive, which means the function is increasing. So for example, one case like this would be like that, could be other cases. I again encourage you to be able to, to draw them out. So in this case, because it went from negative to positive, we acquired a local minimum. In the second case, it's the other way around. The function goes from positive, which means the, the derivative goes from positive, which means the function is increasing, to negative, which means the function is decreasing. And then you have the exact opposite picture here, where it goes from positive to negative, And then the point turns out to be a local maximum. Okay, so be very careful. Just because a point is a critical point, it doesn't mean that it's going to be a local maximum or a local minimum. It could be neither. For example, a derivative might not exist and an asymptote, it does not make it a local maximum or minimum. Now, for a more practical example, let's take a look at a particular function um, and find all local extrema. So once again, that means minimum and that means maximum. The first step is to find critical points and then discuss the behavior around them. So the very first thing we're going to do is find critical points and recall that there's two cases, when the derivative is positive and when the derivative does not exist. So first of all, I have to find my derivative. So it's going to be in this case, 3x squared minus 6x. And now I have to solve for when the derivative is zero. So 3x squared minus 6x is zero. I can factor out 3x, x minus two. And so I'm gonna get two roots, x is zero here and x is two here. So these are my two critical points from this case. And then my second case is when the derivative does not exist. Now let's take a look at my derivative here. It's this right here. It's this quadratic function, a parabola on a graph. There are no x values that I cannot plug in here, which means that the derivative will exist everywhere. So the second case produces no solutions. Okay, so my two critical points are x equals zero and x equals two. And the next thing, according to the first derivative test that I have to do is figure out, does the derivative change sign around zero and does it change sign around two? So what happens before zero and after zero? What happens before two and after two? The easiest way to do this is to create a little line diagram, okay? So I'm going to draw a number line and put all of my critical points that I've just found on the number line. So my points are zero and two. What I care about is the derivative's behavior around these points and what does that actually mean for the function. So on the side here, I'm going to keep track of the sign of the derivative because I only care about whether it's positive or negative. I don't care about the actual value. And I'm going to keep track of what that means in terms of the behavior of the function, okay? So there's a couple of ways of actually producing the rest of this graph. I find that the easiest one is to think of the points in different regions. So these critical points zero and two have divided the entire number line into three regions. This one, the middle one, and the right one, okay? So I'm going to pick a point in each region and figure out whether my derivative at that point is positive or negative. What is true of one point in this region will be true of all points in this region that were separated uh, by the critical point. Okay, so pick a negative number here before zero, minus 10, and we're gonna plug it into our derivative. So is this going to be positive or negative at minus 10? Again, I don't actually care about the value itself, I only care about it, whether it's positive or negative. So if you plug in minus 10 here, I'll notice that that gets squared, so that's 100. 300 minus 60, that's still a positive number, which tells me that the derivative here is positive. Now, you're gonna do the exact same thing for the other two regions. So now we have to pick a point between zero and two, for example, one, and plug it into our derivative. Is it going to be a positive number or a negative number. I plug in one, I get three minus six, that's negative, so this is going to be negative. And then finally for the last region, I have to plug in number in here, so let's say three, 
you plug it in, you'll see that it's going to be positive. So what does that mean for the function itself? If the derivative is positive, that means the slope of the tangent line is positive, which means that the function itself is increasing. When the derivative is negative, it's decreasing. And when the derivative is positive, again, it's increasing. And now you can essentially just trace what that means in terms of the shape of the function, right? So if it was first increasing and then decreasing, obviously at that point, we've encountered a local max. If it was decreasing and then increasing, here we've encountered a local min. Okay, so it is the change in sign of the derivative that produces either a local minimum or a, or a local maximum. So here, our answer is, for all the local extrema of this function, we have local maximum at x equals zero, and we have a local minimum at x equals two. Second derivative test, will also allow us to classify whether a given critical point is a local minimum or a local maximum. So it's an alternative to the first derivative test. Um, the assumptions are slightly different. We're first of all supposing that we can in fact take the second derivative, which means the first derivative is differentiable. And we're also supposing we have a point at which the derivative is zero, which means we have a point at which the tangent line is horizontal. So then what are the conclusions? We have two cases. Either the second derivative is positive, which means the function is concave up. So it has an upwards cup shape. Now on this shape, the point where the tangent line is horizontal has to be this point at the bottom, which means that this case results in a local minimum. And analogously, the second case is the reverse version of this. If the second derivative is negative, it means that the function is concave down. And the point where my tangent line is horizontal turns out to be a local max. So this is another way to check for whether a critical point is a local minimum or a local maximum. You can use the first derivative test and check the behavior around the function's critical points, or you can apply the second derivative case in the case where the critical point um, was found using the fact that the derivative was zero. The other thing that the second derivative is very useful for is in production of better detailed graphs. So critical points are extremas if the first derivative changes sign around them, a point at which concavity or the second derivative changes sign is called an inflection point. So once again, let's go through a particular example here of the same function as from the last slide. So I have x cubed minus 3x plus 1. I'm going to look for concavity changes. And this process is going to be mimicking the process from the last slide almost exactly, except for I will be doing this entire analysis with second derivative as opposed to the first one. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to find the second derivative. To find second derivative, I have to go through the first. So the first derivative being 3x squared minus 6x. Then the second derivative is 6x minus 6. So my potential inflection points are exactly where the second derivative is either 0 or does not exist, more or less. So let's take a look at this. Where is this 0? I have to solve that. So 6x minus 6 is 0, which will produce x equals 1 as my potential inflection point. And I'm also going to look for cases when the second derivative does not exist. They might or might not be actual points, but they will tell me about concavity changes, and I have to analyze those. So here, we're still dealing with the polynomial. 6x minus 6 exists everywhere. So this case will produce no solutions. OK? And then, because I'm looking for concavity changes around the potential inflection points, I'm going to do the exact same thing as last time and draw myself a number line. I'm going to put the points that I've just found and these are what I call potential inflection points or pips. 
their potential for now because I don't yet know if the concavity actually changes at those points. So I'm going to put all the points that I found here, which in this case is just one, on my graph. And then I'm going to do the exact same type of analysis, but on the second derivative, not the first, okay? So this one potential infection point split my entire number line into two pieces. So I'm going to find a number from this side to plug in and a number from this side to plug in. Um, the best number to plug in, if it's possible, is zero. Zero lives out here. So I plug in zero into here. I get minus six. Again, I'm not after the value. I'm actually just after the sign. So this says that the, the second derivative there is negative. If I find a number here, let's say two, I plug it into here, I get a positive six. So the second derivative on this side is positive. Second derivative describes concavity. It's negative here, which means that on this side, the function is concave down. And it's positive here, which means on this side, the function is concave up. So this is an actual point on the graph. I can plug it in and figure out the value. And concavity did change from down to up, which means that this, in fact, is a full-fledged inflection point. Now, let's try to put all of this information together and sketch a graph of this function with everything that we've just found out. What I found from previous information is that these are the local max and min, and one is my inflection point. So I'm going to try to put all of this on the graph. Now, um, before I start putting on the scale, I'm going to have to think about what are the points that I'm interested in. Um, so I know 0, 1, and 2 in terms of x values are the points of interest. So I'm also going to compute f of 0, f of 1, and f of 2. So I know exactly where to sketch those in terms of their y coordinates. Plugging them in, I can see that f of 0 is 1, f of, ne of 1 is uh, negative 2, and f of 2 is negative 3. Once you have some points on the graph to work with, I strongly recommend labeling them with what you found them to be so you don't lose track of that information. So what we found out was that zero was a local max, two, uh, sorry, one was an inflection point and two was a local min. Okay, and now all I have to do is actually trace these shapes and put them all together organically onto this graph. So um, I noticed that up until this point, the function was supposed to be increasing and it's supposed to be increasing in the concave down manner. So here I'm going to have something that looks like this, that I have to form a local maximum, which means that after zero, the function is increasing, decreasing, but it continues to decrease in the concave down manner until point one. So it decreases from concave downwardly until one, at which point I then have to start decreasing, but in the concave up manner until point two. So my concavity here changes. And then after point two, the function is increasing and it's increasing in the concave up manner. So that way. Okay, my graph is not the smoothest. It's supposed to be a fairly smooth curve, but you get the idea. So you notice how at the concavity change, it went from concave up to concave down, sorry, the other way around, from concave down to concave up, and the rest of the information matched what we found in the two derivative tests. One um, good thing to always keep in mind is that if you somehow cannot um, resolve all the information you found on the graph, somehow your graph pieces don't quite um, work together, it means that you've probably made a small mistake somewhere in your analysis and potentially one of your signs is a little bit off. So if you cannot make it work on the graph, do go back through and rework your algebra because that's likely where the mistakes lie. Okay, so the graph is yet another way to make sure that your analysis was actually correct.